Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm Hot Rod Bob, and you've got gas. We're back. We've been gone over the weekend, well, about four days, and transit traveling around. Went to Bonneville's, other places in Utah, and just got back. We're back in sunny Southern California. Well, where you guys are, it might be a little warm. Where I'm at, it's uh, low 70s, nice and comfortable here at the coast. But one of the questions that came up, and it was brought to us by Cassie Nunez, who uh, we had a discussion about this last night. I said, hey, it's an old discussion that it's really not talking to, worth talking about, but hey, what the heck? Let's give it a shot. All right. All of you that are watching this are car people. And I say car people because, hey, like Cassie Nunez, my wife Peg, they're into cars. They know a lot about cars. <clears throat> so there's not car guys. There's car people. But if you bought your car or built your car, does that make you any more or any less of a car person? Hi, Richard. How are you doing this morning? Well, to me, it doesn't make any difference. Not everyone has the skills necessary to build a car, the time it takes to build a car, or the finances to build a car. A lot of people like, well, they like other things in their cars, or they only have one car. So they can't have a second car, a hot rod or a muscle car that sits in a garage. They may not even have a garage, but they want a special car. So you'll get someone that'll go to a dealership, plunk down the cash after specking out or finding something that's got a lot of the goodies they want on, say, a Camaro, a Mustang, a Challenger, a Charger, or something of that nature. It can be a Porsche. It can be a Corvette. It can be any car that an enthusiast might gravitate to. Did they buy it? Yeah. Does that make them any less of a car person? In my mind, no. It does not. The enthusiasm for the car, the hobby, is what makes you a car person. My wife did not build her car. Oh, she has put cars together and modified cars. Hey, Eddie Shore, how are you doing? You got some comments? Bring them on. If you've built your own car from the ground up, let me know here. I bet 90% of the people into hot rodding or collector cars <coughs> have bought a car and modified it upgraded it, improved it, but didn't take down to the very last nut and bolt and put it back together again. You didn't build it from the ground up. I had someone tell me they restored their car. When I looked under the car, nothing had been touched. I said, you repainted it and reupholstered it, and you cleaned it. And they go, yeah, well, that's restored. No, that's refurbished. Restored is when you take a car down to the bare nothing and build it back up and make it look as good in every aspect or better than it was when it came off the assembly line. Have I done that? No. Would I like to do that someday? No. That's more work and patience than I have at this point in time. Have I modified cars all my life? Have I changed engines many times? Transmissions, you betcha. <clears throat> Wheels, tires, brakes. Have I redone upholstery? I've had an upholstery shop where you upholster seats. Did I install all the seats of the door panels and headliner? Yes, I did. Will I do that again? No, I won't. But can I? Yes, I could. But when you look at the car hobby, it's about being an enthusiast. Yes, Bobby Z, I'm fuzzy. Getting ready for Christmas. You need a part-time job, so I might become one of Sanders' help us. But most of us have modified, improved, or upgraded a car. Very few of us have actually bought a car in pieces and put it together. Now, I've got a friend with the detonators in... Denver, Ed, and 
he did do just that. He bought a bunch of parts and put together his first hot rod. It was a 1929 Ford High Boy. All right, let's see what we got here. Eddie Shore. He's got two pretty cool sabs. Yes, he does. And I try to keep them running, but I don't have the space tools or knowledge to do the work himself. It's more costly hiring out the repairs, but he also tries to learn after each repair, and it's a great hobby. Exactly what I'm talking about. Ed is a car guy. Now, he's not driving a hot rod, but he's driving cool, collectible cars. Saab 99, and I believe it's a 99, you'll, you'll correct me, it's a, an old Saab Fastback. He's also got one of the coolest Saabs ever made, a fiberglass-bodied sports car called the Saab Sonnet. Now, is he a sports car guy? Kind of, he had a Mini Cooper before that, or a Mini, a real Mini, not the BMW Mini you see on the road today, but a real Mini built by the Brits, Designed by the Brits with British components. Not a BMW thing with a mishmash of engines, transmissions. So he did that. Eddie is a car guy. Now he races. Just like I do these days. One thirty second scale. He's got some 124ths as well. Cassie Nunez, who started this topic, she thinks the argument stems from a factory-built car like a Hellcat versus someone building a Charger from the 70s, that started out with just a shell. They're both car guys. The guy who built on older vehicles because he loved the older vehicle. The guy who has the current Hellcat, more power to him. Actually, he's got a bigger wallet than most. But it's still an enthusiast car. And you're still an enthusiast to buy one, own one, or drive one. When you think about it, the cost of building an engine today that would replicate the power provided by a Hellcat or a Dodge Demon is staggering. And it would cost more for that engine than I've got in my whole hot rod. Now, when we talk about that, and I'll, and I'll use me as an example. I bought my car as a non-running complete vehicle. Now, it was non-running. I got it running. I knew, I found what the problem was, and I fixed it. And I drove it in stock original form for a number of months. And I started collecting the pieces I wanted to put on the vehicle and modify it. Make it a hot rod. Now, I found the aluminum head. I found the dual carburetor setup. I had a friend make a dual exhaust for it out of a stock exhaust manifold. I had the interior reupholstered. Hi, Kimberly. How you doing? Yeah, I miss seeing you on Saturday at the Drags as well. Only Trujillo, also from Irwindale Drags, is watching. Denny Santos. Marlon Mitchell. I was just at Marlon's shop this morning. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Gary Spears. Jay Thomas. Bobby Z. A whole bunch of people. Eddie Shore, who's back again. 66 and a, it's a, nine, a sob 96. Thank you. Dave Franklin, his star liner, stock from the factory. If I modify it, it'll lose its value. Very true to an extent. Resto mods now seem to be going for a good price, but a real original car, that's tough. Denny Sanders, two-lane blacktop, cover the point of those who build their hot rods and those who don't as much so by their hot rod ready built from the dealership. You can build a car that's going to be quicker than you can get off the showroom floor. No question about that. But sometimes, as with the case of the Dodge Demons, you're hard-pressed to build a car that is as quick right off the showroom. Neil Pang says, have I got a job to be Santa? <laughs> oh, I'm working on it, Bunky. Yeah, you're not sitting on my lap, though. I don't care what you say, Neil. Ain't going to happen. Ron Safried, money is the thing now. Back years ago, it was nothing to see five engines and fenders, you name it, around here. You just can't afford it now, but I always like a good project. And you know what? I've had projects. And I'll give you an example, and I gave this one to Cassie last night. I have or had two 1956 Chevrolet station wagons. 
both two tens. One was stock. I mean, just completely stock. Now, it needed upholstery. It needed carpeting. It needed a whole interior. The paint was patinaed. I wasn't going to change that. I kind of liked it, and the guy who owns it now does too. It had a 265 cubic inch V8 and a slip and slide power glide. Stock brakes. Stock suspension. It was a stock vehicle. It ran great. It drove fine. But was it what I wanted? No. So I put together a list of things I was going to do to that car. Well, I wanted upgraded engines. So a 350. Now, along with the 350, I wanted fuel injection. I wanted fuel economy. I wanted good, reliable transportation. Turn the key, start it up, and pull away. I wasn't too worried about high horsepower. I just wanted enough to be able to tow our little camper trailer behind us. Well, I got to tow it. I got to stop it. I got to add disc brakes. Well, I want to sit comfortably, so I've got to reupholster the interior. I've got to insulate. I've got to put carpeting in. I've got to put some new uh, new headliner in. It had no headliner. I've got to do all the things necessary to the interior to bring it up to a comfortable level. And stopping it would be disc brakes and, gosh, the transmission, a power glide. Mm, yeah, I don't want to do that. Yes, Phil, I miss hanging out with you in the in the uh, tower of the drag strip, and hopefully we get to do that again soon. When I put it down on paper, the cost of upgrading the 56 Chevy I had was about $12,000 if I did the majority of the work myself. Now, nothing I was going to do could not be done by me, and I've done those things before. So I looked at that and decided, well... Let's get started. So I started putting a list together, part numbers and so forth. We went to a cruise night, and my wife happened to notice, notice this nice-looking 56 Chevy 210 wagon. Well, it had disc brakes. Okay, check that off the list. It had a Corvette 350 fuel-injected motor. Hmm. Okay, check that off the list. That's nice and reliable. Get it serviced anywhere. It had a 700R automatic overdrive transmission. Cool. That's great for cruising. Had reasonably good paint. A fresh interior. Power steering. Okay. Power brakes. Hmm. The cost? The same as I paid for the car that needed everything. I mean, dollar for dollar. It was the same. Well, I bought the car that didn't need the work and sold the car that needed the work. Does that make me any less of a hot rodder? No. But I've done some upgrades to the newer car. I've made some changes to it. It was sitting way high in the air. It had wider tires on the back. Hi, Paul Summers. How are you? And it had some other issues. Steering needed some attention. Suspension needed some attention. So I did that. I fixed some of the steering. I added sway bars. Now, I didn't do it personally myself on the sway bars. The reason being, I had put them on the previous one and got very frustrated with my alignment, my setup, and putting them on under the conditions I had to work with. It was Mentally better for me to pay someone to install them on this car. And I say mentally better because my patience is gone when it comes to some of this stuff. So I didn't do it. Hi, Scott Keo. How are you doing this morning? So I had the shop, full-scale hot rods, add the front and rear sway bars for me. Now, on the back of this car, there were about 10-inch tall shackles in the rear. Raised the car up quite a bit. Uh, too high. Now, the reason they did that is because they had real wide tires in the back that actually rubbed. Well, it needed tires. The car hadn't been driven in years. The tires were very bad anyway. I went to a narrower tire that fit inside the wheel well on the same wheels. I got stock shackles, took out the huge ones, and replaced them with the stock ones, bringing the car down about four inches in the rear. Now, there were a little 
few other things I did. I made sure the fluids were topped off or actually changed all the fluids and improved that. I changed some interior comp components. There were pieces missing, but I had them. I put them on. Did I build this car? No. I did meet the person who did build the car. And it was a driveway build. Did a nice job. Does the car still need work? Yeah. Will I do it? No. Not all of it. There's some I will do. It doesn't make me any less of a hot rodder. Now let's go back to another car I did, my Plymouth. As I said, I bought that as a roller, basically. It was a complete car, but didn't run. I got it running. I collected the parts, started putting it together. I had to have the engine rebuilt. I could not do that myself. Not that I don't have the skill to do a rebuild, but this needed to be bored. It needed to be balanced. The crank needed to be ground, and I needed a new cam. Could I have done all that by farming it out to a machine shop and then assembling it myself? Yeah, it would have taken me a lot longer. And you know what? The guys that do that for a living do it much better. So I had a company called Eddings Engine Rebuilding out in San Fernando, California. They were a sponsored L.A. County Raceway where I worked at the time. And they built the motor with the parts I provided. Nice ISKI cam, Edmunds aluminum cylinder head, off a dual intake. We got it done. Install the engine? Well, I was traveling at the time for business. My regular job kept me on the road. So I paid a friend to install the engine that engine and he did got the car running i did some other things to it and got it going the upholstery well i had to shop down the street upholster the seats but i did the door panels and the headliner and the carpeting i installed everything when it came to the front suspension well it was up in the air easy to rebuild those i rebuilt the front suspension when it came time to add disc brakes well, I didn't have the time. Again, I was traveling. So a friend of mine who made a kit to put disc brakes on my Plymouth did the upgrade for me. Got disc brakes. It's safer. I did the rear end change, though, putting a late model Mopar rear end in the back. Then later on, I put a Chevrolet V8 engine in it. Yes, I installed the engine. Now, I positioned the engine, marked where the mounts were going to be, and had a friend come over and weld those mounts in. Did that make me any less of a hot rodder because I had someone weld in mounts? I didn't have a welder of that, of that power to put those in. He came over. He was a traveling welder, and he would go to races and fix chassis and such. I knew his quality and capability. So... He welded in the mounts, the transmission, and the engine mounts. I installed them. I got everything put together. Again, I started traveling. I had a friend wire it so that it fired up and started. Again, that doesn't make me any less of a hot rodder. Now, the other thing, too, is my car has flames on it. Did I do the flames? Well, partially. It was actually myself and two friends. Ron... Uh, Ron Miller was the guy with the gun, and he sprayed the flames. Mike Bishop and myself, Mike from American Rotter Magazine at the time, and myself drew them out the way we wanted them to look, and that was very 50-ish. We marked them, we drew them out, we masked them off, we sanded it, Ron sprayed it, we pulled the tape off, I had someone stripe around the edges. Did that make me any less of a hot rodder? No, but I paid someone to do it. Hi, Mike Basso. How are you doing today? Hot rodding is about the enthusiasm. It's about the individual. It's not about where the car was built or who built it. Like I said, about 90% of the people I know have purchased the vehicles they're driving. Some of them have done some modifications or upgrades. I have one friend that bought one of the 34 Ford kits and put it together. He's retired with a lot of money and a lot of time on his hands, and his wife would send him to the garage to get him out of her hair. He put the car together. 
He still has the car. He has other cars. Did he build them? No. He bought them. Does that make him any less of a hot rodder? No. So when I hear the argument, well, you bought a car, I really don't care. You bought the car because you're an enthusiast. And that's what the hobby is about. The enthusiasm and the enthusiasts. There are some that can, and there are some that can't. Whatever the reason is, the enthusiasm and the person is what makes the hobby what it is. I'm Hot Rod Bob. You've got gas. The morning edition. Thanks for tuning in. Glad you could be here. Hey, have you picked up the latest issue of Rotting USA? No. Pick it up. Check it out. I'm particular to page 40 myself. I wrote it. Check it out. All right, guys. I'm Hot Rod Bob. You've got gas. The morning edition brought to you by Service Tech Equipment in Simi Valley, California. All the equipment you need to outfit that shop. If you're going to do the work on your car, you've got to have the right equipment. Get it from Service Tech. They'll deliver. They'll install. They'll train. Check them out. I'm Hot Rod Bob, and you've got gas. The morning edition. Take care. I'll talk to you again tomorrow. Who knows where the topic will be? I'll let you know about 10 o'clock. Take care, folks. Have a great day.